everybody. Good afternoon. Good morning, depending on where you are joining me from. My name is Barton Seaver. I'm a chef. I'm an author, a proud husband, father of Alden and Rosie, our beautiful, beloved little boys. We live here on the ragged, jagged, delicious coast of Maine, where I am joining you from today. I hope that wherever you are, you are having as beautiful a day as we are here. Just sort of an, a string of autumn glory. These days just seem to last and there's still some leaves on the trees. Life is good. And we're coming up into the holiday season, which makes things even better because we just get to think about and focus on eating all the time. And that's just the greatest thing in the world. Thanksgiving is one of my very favorite holidays simply because the focus turns to, well, just diversity of tastes and textures and sights and sounds and smells and, of course, gathering those we love around the table. And it's no longer 2020. It's 2021, which means hopefully some of you uh, are in a position now, now that we know enough about COVID, uh, vaccines, etc., that I hope that you are able to have a safe gathering uh, with friends and family. Maybe, well, I know a lot of us skipped that last year, but I hope that this year is a glorious reunion for you and that we all stay safe. Uh, so we're going to be doing our normal events. Thanks for joining. I already see that we have a number of uh, friends that regularly join, so nice to see you again. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things. So over on the right-hand side of the screen, right text to my face, you'll see the question box. If you have a question that you would like to ask, go ahead and type it on in there, and I will attempt to get to it in the time that we have today. If there's a question that's already been asked, you can just click the little heart icon right next to it, and uh, you can vote that up the queue so that I'll make sure to get to it. Uh, no question is off topic today. Yes, we're talking about Thanksgiving sides, but you want to talk about unicorns or whatever, science fiction movies, whatever you want. We can go there. Why? Because these are your events. Thanks for being a part of the Ruby family and for having me a part of your family. So thanks for that. So those of you who have joined before know that I like to start off with uh, just sort of a little statement of gratitude because cooking is an act of love. It is an act of kindness. It is something that we do for others. We express ourselves through food. Um, it, it, is, it is that act of kindness and caring for others. And the very first ingredient in that is gratitude. And well, it's just a really great way to start off every dish. And so uh, something that I am grateful for today, and I hope that you will take a moment uh, before next, when next you cook, to just pause, be present, and, and sort of think on something that you are grateful for. But, um, you know, I've, uh, I, over the last... Uh, several years, but really over in the last six months, I have had a, uh, at times, disabling uh, injury to my neck and shoulder. And uh, I've been, it's, it's really been very hard. Um, but you know what? I am grateful for good days. And even more importantly, I am grateful for bad days. And uh, yeah, that's where we are today. Challenge makes us better. And it also sort of sweetens the deal when things are going well and brings our mind to it. So this is not a sob story by any means, but uh, I appreciate you allowing me to share a little bit of my life with you. And that's what I'm grateful for. So if there's something you're grateful for coming into this Thanksgiving season, you know, throw it in the comments over there. I'd love to hear from you. All right. So I've got a couple of things that we're going to do. Uh, you know, Thanksgiving sides is a, is a massive topic. Uh, and one that is, of course, governed by the intense traditionality of this meal and the fact that uh, this really is an intergenerational meal and that because of that, we are sort of constantly borrowing and integrating and evolving and adapting traditions of multiple generations. So there's not just one opinion at the table, as you know, around Thanksgiving. So uh, what I'm going to do here is obviously not what your grandmother did or what your father did, <coughs> etc. So we're just going to be talking about some tips and techniques and things. And uh, yeah, so with that, we're going to be talking about some mashed potatoes and a, and a recipe that I've got for that that I particularly like. Uh, we'll talk about a cocktail to start off with because, <coughs> excuse me. I need a cocktail right now for my throat. Uh, we're going to be talking about a couple of sauces and, uh, well, that 
stuffing and all sorts of stuff, but I want to make sure to get to your questions. So the first thing I want to sort of start off with is, is the concept of freshness, fresh. That's something that I find is almost universally lacking in the Thanksgiving meal. Why? Because, well, there's a lot of rich food, there's a lot of foods of the season, uh, you know, heartier, denser flavors, etc., roasted things, and, and these are all things, flavors that feel great, and, and they are of the season and are appropriate. But oftentimes, I find myself just sitting at the table just like, damn, I wish I had a salad, right? Or I wish I just had something bright and potent and reviving of the palate. If any of you have ever been to a tasting menu experience at a restaurant, uh, you know that you need those little sort of revivals, <laughs> those little palate cleansers, right, to keep the meal interesting. So I'm going to be talking a lot about that, sort of how to integrate those fresh, acidic components into dishes that you might already be doing, uh, as well as some tips and techniques about sort of making things a little bit easier on you, the cook, uh, throughout the process. So let's start with a cocktail, right? So something I really like and uh, is uh, a remnant of my time living and working over in the Iberian Peninsula, over in Spain, and spending time on the Portuguese border as well, Portugal border, white port. You've all heard of port wine, right? I mean, we all, we all know port wine, but there's also white port. Um, and white port is fresh. It's bright. Uh, there are some like this one here that's aged for 10 years and casks, so it gets a, a much deeper, richer color to it. But it's fresh, it's bright, it's light, ebullient in its flavor and sort of presentation. It's about 20% alcohol, <coughs> excuse me, as are most ports. So it's perfect for a little cocktail. You know, I mean, hey, yeah, sure, you can serve gin, gin and tonics and that's great, but it's just more alcohol and I prefer to actually just sort of extend the drinking throughout the whole meal rather than front load it with heavy cocktails. So something I really like to do is a little bit of white port uh, over ice. And uh, let's see, what else did I have? A uh, little orange wedge. I got, you know, like Thanksgiving, it's always a bit of a mess, right? You got stuff all over the place. So put just a little bit of orange juice in there, wipe the rim. And then I've got some sprigs of fresh herbs, right? So basil is one that works really well. Uh, mint is the other one that works really well, sort of brightens flavors, heightens them, brings out that fresh quality. And then just a little bit of tonic water. And the density of that port will kind of stay, keep it down at the bottom, as opposed to the tonic. So just stir it up and uh, there you go. White port wine spritzer. There you go. And this is just hot damn delicious. That's all there is to it. Slightly nutty because of the, the port wine and the aged ness aged factor of it gives it this sort of mature appeal. Uh, it is perfectly sweet without being cloying by any means. It's not like the heavy, rich port that you get, you know, in, in the in the red ports. Uh, has nice, bright acidity to it. So, again, this is something you can serve to guests. You can drink kind of with abandon and not get plastered. Uh, you maintain your lucidity. So. Here's a fun little cocktail for you. So a little basil sprig, white port, a little tonic, and I'm going to continue to enjoy that as we go through the, through the seminar here today. What's the next thing I want to do? All right, now that we have the cocktail out of the way, let's talk about mashed potatoes, All right? Everybody makes mashed potatoes, something that's uh, pretty standard on the Thanksgiving menu. But mashed potatoes are one of those things that, yeah, because of its simplicity, I find that it's very easy to get wrong. Um, and the factors here are what kind of potato are you using, basically how you cooked it, and then what you put in it, and the method you use to mix it. So one is a decision process um, in terms of what potatoes. The other is how you cook it, so that's chemistry. The next is what you mix into it, so that's flavor, and sort of what the personality of it is. And then how you mix it is mechanical, right? So there are sort of critical control points in all of this. Now, I grow potatoes here on the farm. Uh, I have, I think I did, let's see, I did five different varieties of them this year. And I love just a, a host of different textures and starchinesses and flavors and all that. But when it comes down to mashed potatoes, the russet is the king. It's, it's you know, it's otherwise to me a pretty boring potato. I mean, it makes great french fries. It makes great mashed potatoes. Why? 
because of the nature of the starch and how it's sort of all put together, Genevieve Co. Uh, staff writer at the New York Times food section has a really great article about mashed potatoes and um, she recommends steaming them. Uh, so I recommend checking out that article, Genevieve Co. New York Times on her mashed potatoes. She's got, she's got a perfect recipe for it. But what I make is a garlic, I don't mean to threaten you with a knife, sorry about that, uh, a garlic yogurt mashed potato. And I first came up with this recipe when uh, working with O Magazine, Oprah's Magazine. We were doing a feature on sustainable seafood, uh, which was very fun. Flew out to her house in Montecito and just had a nice time of it, but uh, came up with this recipe for her. And it's been one of the most, I think probably the most popular recipe that I've ever, I've ever made. And that's the power of Oprah folks, not the power of the recipe. But what you, uh, sort of the critical control points on the russets are uh, peel them, peel them pretty fresh to when you're going to use them and then cut them into the same size piece, roughly, so that they're gonna cook at the same time. The last thing you want is for those edges of the potato to sort of slough off or to get, um, let's see, of course, the computer turns off here. Let's see if we can get it back. Probably not, there we go. Um, those, the potatoes kind of start falling apart, etc. You don't wanna overcook them. So cutting them the same size pieces, that means just the same thickness to them. So they cook at an even rate. The next critical control points on this are going to be how much water you add. Now water draws flavor out, right? It dilutes the flavor of the vegetable. And what does potato cooking water taste like at the end of the process? Tastes a lot like potatoes now, doesn't it? So if you've got this much potato and you fill it all the way up here with water, you've basically just made, created a situation where you're going to lose more flavor. Um, there's just more water to absorb it. Plus, you're also going to have a little bit less control over the cooking. Why is that? Well, because it takes longer for more water to come to a boil. And then you have to apply more heat in order to keep it at the same simmer, etc. And just barely covering the potatoes is the very best way. You don't want them, the water to evaporate to the point where any of them get exposed, but there you go. The other thing, the garlic episode act, um, component of this, and this is where the things that you add come in. I like to add the garlic. Now, boiled garlic is a really fun way to experience the, you know, what is one of my very favorite ingredients. When it boils, it gets a really sweet, a lot of that acidity, the Elysium, Allicin, the, um, the really the, the potent component of, of garlic, allicin, um, uh, comes out. And so you end up with a soft, sweet flavor to it. Uh, so boil it right with the potato. So I'm going to step off screen. I don't know if I am off screen, but uh, just fill this up with water. The garlic goes right in there. The other thing to make sure you add is salt uh, because those potatoes are going to absorb water. What do you want them to absorb? Well, water that you want in your final dish. Where am I going? Okay, so I filled it up with cold water, put it on the back of the stove. Trusty box of salt. Just a little bit to season the water. So there you go. The next component of that is we're going to wait till the potatoes are just barely fork tender, just past that, and then mix in Greek yogurt. You can also use labna. You can use um, various fat levels of the Greek yogurt, depending on what you want. But I like the richness to it. I don't eat a lot of mashed potatoes around the house, partially because my wife doesn't like them, um, which is weird. But anyway, I digress. This is not a not a marital counsel session. But I mean, of all the all the issues to have with a spouse, like that, like life is good if that's the only thing we fight over is mashed potatoes and the fact that she puts six layers in her seven layer dip. I mean, seriously, really? Anyway, I digress. Hi, I'm back. I don't, I, yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm a little strange today and that's okay. So the next thing I wanna talk about are salads. Um, I mentioned at the outset of this that salads are a really fun thing to have on the table and they sort of that add that freshness. They also add great texture, but they also present a lot of seasonal vegetables in a slightly different way. So one of my very favorite salads is a celery salad. Now, 
this came about for me because I bought celery because I needed one stock for some stock that I was making or whatever. And then I still had the rest of the head laying around. Right? Celery is not typically an ingredient you use a lot of at any one time. Right? Because it's sort of used as a flavoring rather than as a main ingredient. So I'm sitting here on all this celery and I was like, what am I going to do with that? Well, made a salad out of it. And uh, that's one of my very favorite things. Now, the key to a salad is that you've got multiple components to your meal, right? And you've got stuff that you did the day ahead, your pies, whatever. You've got your turkey or your veg base thing going and you're having to you got all your sides. Take the work out of it for yourself. This celery I cut on a mandolin and I cut it uh, about an hour ago or so, but you can, leave, you can cut this a day ahead. Now the key to this, take the whole head of celery and working on a mandolin at a, about a 45 degree angle, run the whole thing down. You don't need to worry about the strings. You don't need to worry about uh, the leaves or taking any of it out. Just make sure it's clean. There's no dirt on the inside, sort of concave section of that celery. Uh, slice it on a slight bias. That way I think you get a lot more flavor out of it, but you also just get bigger pieces that are a little easier to eat. You're not chasing them around with a fork. Uh, you get a little more lift under them, etc. So the components to the salad are really very simple. It's celery, pecans, great ingredient of the season, right? Very traditional to the meal. And uh, I use a mustard vinaigrette. Now this is red wine, mustard, and olive oil. You can use a whole grain mustard, which I really like because that uh, it adds really just a wonderful visual appeal to it. Uh, but this is a Dijon based. And uh, you don't need a whole lot of it, probably just a couple of tablespoons. And this is a very free form salad. Um, it's not a strict recipe. You don't, just a tiny bit of salt. It's my very expert tossing technique where I'm stirring with the tongs and tossing and you have end up with this very beautiful looking salad, right? I mean, it's nice textures, it's nice colors, it's nice sort of architecture to it. And then to finish it off, I'm going to go grab a plate so I can show you sort of the full thing. To finish it off, uh, Parmesan cheese over the top is a really nice, uh, it just adds so much flavor to it and very little of it goes a long way. And the way that I do the Parmesan is also with the peeler which is my favorite way to use Parmesan. Sure, grating it into, you know, snowy dust powder is wonderful, but I like these sort of long strands of it, these shards that uh, have a lot more plate presence to it. I mean, if you're gonna spend the money on a great ingredient, the king of cheeses such as Parmesan is, use it, make it known, put it out there, let it shine. And so you end up with these nice sort of big bites of this very pungent cheese. You don't need it to be fully integrated. The celery and the pecans, that crunchy texture stands alone as is. And then you get this once every third bite or so chunk of Parmesan. Woo, man, it's really, really good. So here's the thing. I just made the salad. I dressed the salad. You probably have about two hours before the salad is wilty. That's a very good thing. That gives you a lot of leeway. So that you can put it on the table first, you kind of forget about it, put it over there, and it just works. Other salads that are really good in this way, other ingredients like fennel, thin shaved on a mandolin, carrots, uh, carrots shaved down. Let's see, I just happened to pull a couple of wayward carrots out of my garden as I was coming back from the compost. So another way to use carrots is you know, you, we all peel them this way, right? Just keep going. Rotate around as you go, just holding by the tip. And what do you end up with? This beautiful confetti, you know, of carrot. And you get all that flavor, all that texture, all of that crunch to it, the sweetness, the aromatic of the carrot, but it's easier to eat. It actually integrates into whatever else it's with. And if it's just these sort of wedges or circles of carrots, where do they end up? 
at the bottom of the salad bowl and they're the last things to be eaten and they're hard to eat because you got to chase them around the fork. So integrating carrots like this is a really great way to do that. Toss it in with your celery, toss it in with some red onions. You've got a mirepoix salad, some shaved fennel, etc. These are crunchy vegetables that maintain their texture over the course of a couple hours, even if dressed. And that is a big benefit to the Thanksgiving cook. All right. So that's salads. We got to start on our mashed potatoes, which are just coming up to a boil here. And uh, let's take, a, let me just clean up a minute and then we'll take some questions. Hey everybody. All right. Uh, let's start up at the top here. Does using both from Darlene, does using both oven racks change the way food roasts and what racks to use for which food? Thanks. What a great question. Um, yes, the, the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, you know, when cooking, it's the amount of heat, uh, the size and cut of the ingredient, the nature of the ingredient, and proximity to heat that are sort of the critical components there. So if you've got an oven that has, you know, and every oven is different, and I'm not just talking this Cornifay oven from a wolf range, no this cornifei to the next cornifei are going to be different. Uh, every oven is its own thing. You need to learn your own oven if it has hot spots, etc. So the, depending on which cooking method you are using, so if you have your oven on roast, some ovens will just have a bottom heat unit. Others will do dual heat where you've got from above and below. So that is going to change the nature of, of what you're cooking. I tend to put the things that need to cook quickly, so diced up, you know, chunked up vegetables, you know, uh, root vegetables and such. I put those up at the top because you want to use high heat for those. You want that caramelization. You want that char um, consistency of cooking. So I put those up at the top where heat rises, right? So the top of your oven is going to be uh, more consistent in that temperature, I believe. Um, let's go up there. All right. So we're at a boil now. So I'm just going to turn that down to a, to a simmer. Um, the other thing is how much food you put in your oven at once and also how often you open your oven. Uh, if you're trying to do four things at once where you have two racks and you've got half sheet trays, you know, in each quadrant, et cetera, and you're opening the oven every five minutes to pull one out or to turn or to baste, every time you open that door, you're dramatically reducing the temperature of your oven. So a good way to cook is to sort of strategize around your oven. If you've got a couple of things that cook at the same temperature, cook those first. Your roasted root vegetables, those can cook and be served at room temperature. They don't need to be served hot, especially if you put like a nice little acidic sauce with them, and I'll show you one later. Um, so cook like things with like. Um, the other thing to consider is if you have uh, what vessel you're cooking in. So if you're cooking in a sheet tray that's very thin bottom, you're not going to get a lot of heat conductivity through that. If you've got a uh, pizza stone in your oven, like I've got, and I, I have this in there because it helps to retain heat once this thing gets hot, it uses a lot less energy for the oven because this thing maintains some of the temperature. So it's a sustainability thing for one, but it's also a consistency of cooking. But imagine this is 400 degrees because it preheated in the oven and I put a pan right on top of this. You're going to get a lot more heat transference through this. So the other thing to consider is, are you using you know, a thin sheet tray? Are you using a disposable aluminum tray? or using a cast iron pan. Each of those are gonna have different heat conductivity uh, and are going to yield in different results. Try caramelizing roasted root vegetables in a just a disposable aluminum pan. You're not gonna get any help with it from the pan, is what I'm saying. So there was a lot in there, but basically that's sort of the mechanics of ovens and food. Um, the other thing about Thanksgiving is a lot of people tend to have a very big bird in their oven which takes up a lot of the space, um, if not all of it. So having an oven strategy is a very good thing. Darlene, hey, thanks for your question. I appreciate you. I'm take a sip of my cocktail. 
because it's delicious. And that basil has come out, like flavors all meldy together. Yeah, it's happy. That's good stuff. All right, from Leslie. Hi, friend. How are you? Nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. What's the best way to prepare vegetables like squash, turnips, and rutabagas for the holidays? Hmm. Great question. So those vegetables, I think, really benefit from caramelization, from a deep, rich flavor evolution that comes from roasting or high heat. Uh, I like a mixture of those vegetables. I find that root vegetables get, a, I lose interest in them. Uh, in each individual ingredient after just a couple of bites. Um, I also think that the, the textural contrast you want is, is another thing to go for. So with those vegetables you just mentioned, uh, dice them all up. I put them about maybe one inch pieces uh, so that they're all relatively uniform in size and shape uh, and mix them all together. I put uh, some microplane garlic on them. I don't do sliced garlic because that will burn uh, faster. Uh, so sliced garlic, or sorry, microplane garlic, olive oil, salt. I'm not a big fan of cooking with pepper ahead of time. I like pepper added at the end, but, um, cast iron pan, get it smoking hot. Once it's smoking hot, your oven's at 400 degrees or so, throw them in there, just toss them one time to get sort of an equal, um, no, just, yeah, you sort of an equal, uh, uh, distribution of them and then throw the whole thing into the oven. Uh, I like it that way because I also then serve it in that dish and it has a very nice rustic appeal to it. Uh, a dish that I, or a, a, in addition to that dish that I had working in a restaurant one time, they had a really wonderful sauce that once the vegetables were roasted, deep, dark, charred, caramelized brown, uh, they tossed them in a sauce which was made of mayonnaise, anchovies, uh, Parmesan, grated Parmesan cheese and, uh, parsley. And that mixture when added on, when they come out of the oven, when they're still hot and it sort of tosses it all together, it just lightly dresses them. There was a little bit of lemon juice in there as well. It was a really fun, really interesting way that pumped up their flavor just enormously. And it wasn't about adding expense or being fancy with it. No, it's Parmesan and anchovies are both super rich in umami. And root vegetables do really well with that kick of umami uh, that really brings out their earthiness, but also accentuates and highlights the sweetness in them that, that's naturally there. So uh, that's why it worked so well. And the parsley added this nice fresh uh, component and the lemon juice obviously sort of brighten things. But another way around that is take a little bit of soy sauce to our Worcestershire sauce, uh, other ingredients that have that big umami kick to them, uh, and a little bit of vinegar, something like a sherry vinegar. Uh, or brown rice vinegar with the soy sauce, uh, just a mixture like that. Again, you're not trying to make it an Asian dish necessarily by adding the soy sauce. Uh, you're not trying to alter the nature of the, it's like, hey, here's the roasted root vegetables. These other ingredients are there to just kind of augment and, and accentuate flavors. The other ways to do this uh, are to, to boil them and to mix them in with mashed potatoes. Like celery root mashed potatoes are absolutely fabulous. Celery root mashed on its own can be a little watery. It doesn't hold that same fluffy starchy texture that we like. Uh, but mashed turnips, mashed rutabagas with a good help and a butter in there, just maybe a couple of drops of lemon juice, serve that beautiful sort of ochre orange golden color of rutabagas beautiful pat of butter melting right on top, maybe just a sprinkle of smoked paprika, or yay! Happy times, happy times, folks. Uh, and to make that, you just, just like the potatoes, cut them into similar size shapes and then uh, pieces, and then simmer them with as little water as possible just to cover, and there you go. Hey, thanks, appreciate it. All right, from Donna, hi friend. I'd love a great reliable way to prep cauliflower florets as well as steaks without shooting tiny bits all over the kitchen. <laughs> um, shooting tiny bits all over the kitchen, how are you doing that? Uh, probably by cutting them, huh? Okay, so here's the tip for um, florets that I would use, which is most cauliflower, unless you're buying it at the farmer's market, it's coming unwrapped, right? Uh, but you can fake this by just putting it inside of a plastic shopping bag. Uh, or if you're buying cauliflower at a traditional store that's wrapped in plastic, hold it crown side up, stem side down while still wrapped or wrapped inside of the plastic bag. 
smash it down right onto the core. And what that does is it, you know, the core is this sort of um, conical part of it that's dense. And it, when you smash it down, that pushes up through the head. And what that does is it largely separates most of those florets and they just slough off. They just fall off. Um, and any mess you have, any of those little bits that would shoot all over your kitchen are thus contained inside the bag. Uh, if you do it right, and you can do this with broccoli, cauliflower, it all works. Um, if you do it right, you really don't smash it all up. You really just get florets and you lose very, very little. Uh, when it comes to cutting steaks and uh, not getting those little bits all over the kitchen, uh, sharp, big knife, single cut uh, coming down. You don't want to saw through any back and forth action is going to rip those florets apart and cause little bits to, to come around. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm lucky I just have, I have a whole lot of knives, but I would use a very large, long chef's knife, which is obviously going to be larger than a head of cauliflower and just straight down as much as you can. And if you want to get all samurai about it, just one, if you have confidence, just one smack to it and then go get the dust buster because you got cauliflower all over your kitchen. That's just kind of par for the course. Um, so there you go. Thanks. All right, another question, and then I'll uh, get to talking about stuffing. All right. Dear Chef, thanks for sharing with your gratitude with us. Oh, you're very welcome, Adolf. Uh, as a new cook, I'd like to know how you managed to bring several foods to the table while hot. It is challenging. Thank you, and happy holidays. Adolf, thank you. Happy holidays to you as well, and thanks for joining us. And uh, as a new cook, welcome. Welcome to the wonderful world of delicious. Um, so getting dishes to the table hot, it's all about having a strategy ahead of time. And part of that strategy, the best strategies are to mitigate your variables. So don't try and execute five things all at once because it's difficult. You're putting stress into the situation. My least favorite ingredient in any recipe is stress. So the first thing to consider at all is do you need the dish to be hot? Right? Um, I have found as I grew in my culinary confidence uh, that hot was more just a function of sort of expectation rather than necessarily of the best quality of the dish. Now, sure, something, some, you know, many dishes coming straight off the grill or out of the pan, yes, it's going to be best right then and there. But the bottom line is most dishes also age pretty well, so long as you know maybe what the variables will be there. If you have a salad, for instance, like <clears throat> this, most salads would not age well, right? And I know this is not a temperature thing, but the dressing is kind of that same concept, right? Heat ages foods or sort of evolves them fast, right? So does dressing on a salad. So choosing a salad with ingredients that last and endure under the dressing is the first strategy to do. Um, if every dish you pick is made from temperamental ingredients and fragile things, you've set yourself up for difficulty. So the first is just writing your menu to be executable uh, in, in, the, in an efficient way. Uh, the next thing is also to just plan on having space to keep some things warm. So if you have mashed potatoes, those stay pretty darn hot on their own. If you put them in the right bowl, that doesn't conduct a lot of heat. Like if I put my mashed potatoes, if I serve them in a metal container, what does metal do? That conducts heat, right? So I'm going to lose a lot more heat in a metal bowl than I am if I put it in a nice stone bowl, something like this, that will retain heat a little bit better. The other way to do that is to have a warming zone whether on your oven. So on my stove, this area back here stays warm when my oven is on because that's where the vent is. So I could put things to hold right there. I can also put things up here, etc. So this is not to your question about like executing five things all at once. This is more about the strategy. Uh, and that's really what I would recommend. But, you know, if you're putting on a show because you're a young cook and you're new to this, take pride in this, man. Put on a show. Try and execute five things at once. You know what? 
gather everybody around and put on a show because you're working really hard at this. And that's part of the fun of cooking is the showmanship of it. So embrace that a little bit. And you know what? Thanksgiving is a great time to challenge yourself. I, I always like to do that. I, I chose menus that pushed me a little bit, whether in flavor profiles or the execution of things. So have confidence, have faith, put on a good show. Um, make sure your guests are also participating in this because if you work your butt off to get all your dishes executed and at the table hot, but then Uncle Joe is like still over there watching football and it's going to take 15 minutes to get to the table because the third quarter hasn't ended yet or blah, blah, blah. Or halftime starts in 10 minutes and I'll be there in 10. You know, you're just like, if you want food to be hot, get everybody involved in the process, okay? And here's another thing, a last little bit on this question, but also for every other question. If it doesn't work out, it is deeply okay. Deeply okay. Just have fun. Have another cocktail if you want. Cool. All right. Let's talk about stuffing, folks. You know what's really tasty? Stuffing. You know what's better? Panzanella. What's panzanella? Panzanella is a bread cube salad. It's basically uh, a way in Spain and in Italy and other places to use up leftover bread that's gone stale, uh, whether it then gets toasted uh, or not, or just used in its stale form but then it's tossed in a dressing so that it rehydrates a little bit, softens, and carries other ingredients. So what is stuffing? Well, it's basically stale or toasted bread cubes or crumbs of some sort, right, that are seasoned and then soaked in turkey or stock or whatever, right? So that stuffing sounds a lot like panzanella, just sort of a different approach to it. So. I am all for Thanksgiving stuffing, the tradition of that, and, and like straight up, there's always a bowl of stovetop stuffing on my Thanksgiving table. Why? Because it's been engineered to be delicious, and it's delicious. It's so good, and it's, you know, when else do you eat it? It's, it's, a, it's a taste, a memory. It's this Proustian experience, and that's what Thanksgiving is for, and that's okay. But I also like to do you know, fun, creative dishes. So I have here, this is a baguette that uh, I bought fresh today and then I tore up into pieces by hand. And the reason why I do that is because you end up with a whole variation of different shapes. I mean, it's all the same size, but you end up with a whole lot of texture. And if you just cube it up, you don't end up with nearly as much as you do here. So this was then tossed in a good amount of olive oil, several cloves of garlic on a microplane and a little bit of salt. Uh, and then I just toasted them in the toaster oven for, I think it was about 20 minutes, taking care to toss them and rotate as I went. And I now have very crunchy, very crunchy bread here. So to make a panzanella, uh, and I did this the other night um, when I roasted a chicken, was I took all the roasting juices from that chicken uh, and I had my bread cubes. I have some radicchio. So this is the radicchio head that I've shaved super thin. Uh, I like the bitterness of radicchio because it just blends well and it's a nice component to an otherwise kind of sweet table at Thanksgiving. So some of the radicchio in there, I'd put some parsley in there, etc. So season a little more with salt. And then you can throw herbs in there. You can throw diced butternut squash. This is your palate here. If you've got traditional favorites as a part of your Thanksgiving stuffing that you like to use, like pine nuts or celery, et cetera, go ahead and throw it in there. So basically, you've kind of set this stuffing up to be a room temperature dish. And also, your stuffing is now no longer dependent upon the turkey. By the way, I am not a fan of cooking stuffing inside of a turkey. I think it's just, I just think it's not, it sets yourself up for basically a bad turkey because you have to cook the stuffing to 165 degrees. That's all the way in the center. So the gradation of heat, obviously the turkey is going to be more than 165 if what's inside of it has to get there. So basically you're overcooking your turkey just to make your stuffing safe. And the only reason why you shove it into the turkey is that it absorbs all the roasting juices, right? 
Well, guess what? At the end of roasting your turkey, all those roasting juices are in the bottom of your pan. Throw some of them right into your panzanella, and you have a textured stuffing. Uh, some components to this that I really like to do, dice up some celery, a little bit of garlic, and some dried apricots into very small pieces, uh, as well as some pine nuts or slivered almonds. Saute those in a little bit of butter or turkey fat, whatever is rendered out, and then toss those in. It's a really nice dish. It adds some uh, unexpected texture. Stuffing is very soft, right? And just bready. But this adds texture, and as it sits, it's, you know, this is not just a crouton salad. Those are all going to soften considerably, and it really becomes a very dynamic, interesting way to kind of fill that role of stuffing on your plate. Right. So there you go. That's stuffing. I'm going to go check on my potatoes. Not quite done yet, another five minutes or so. So let's take another couple of questions here. We're at about 2.45, so we've got about another half hour or so. I'm taking another sip of my cocktail because I enjoy being with you. All right, Judith T. Hello, dear friend. Nice to have you join again. Can you suggest heartier sides for our vegetarian friends? Thanks as always for these classes. Sure. So heartier sides uh, for vegetarian friends. So that panzanella is great. Uh, you can leave out the turkey roasting juices very easily. Uh, just a, a veg stock or really honestly just even some water uh, along with some vinegar uh, to help soften it is a really nice, nice way. It you know, throw some roasted butternut squash in there, throw some al toasted almonds in there, celery, the, you know, those apricots that I was talking about, et cetera, or even some fresh fruit. If you can find some plums, something like that, thinly shaved, even apples, something to have all these textural contrasts, but also this wonderful sort of interplay of sweet, bitter, crunchy, all of these other things uh, is really nice. And I, I think respectful way, because it really is this, construction. It's not just the side dish, uh, but it really takes stuffing something, you know, that's one of the centerpieces of the Thanksgiving table and turns it into this really thoughtful, generous construction that's sort of been evolved or adapted specifically to their dietary needs. So I've always found that that is, is a nice way to do. We've got a couple of vegetarian folks that regularly at our, our Thanksgiving table holiday table. So that's one thing that I do. Uh, you know, you have time to, to do often to, to do a risotto, something like that, uh, a side, a side dish that can really act as a main dish. Um, and also there's enough vegetables sort of floating around in the kitchen that to make a grain bowl, takes very little additional effort to have some quinoa and amaranth and barley, whatever it is, sort of simmering away on the back stove that just gets kept warm and fluffed and then is tossed with the roasted root vegetables, you know, maybe a, a nut vinaigrette, et cetera, some fresh herbs. All of a sudden you've, again, sort of taken the sides that are already on the table and made something completely unique and new and fun that's really respectful of the person that you've... Uh, invited to be with you. So there you go, Judith. Appreciate you as always. Hey, Sue. Chef, I'm very much enjoying the class. Well, thank you, friend. My built-in oven just, I don't know. Replacement will be lucky to arrive in January. Yes, with supply chain, that's about true. I have a nice toaster oven. Are there tricks to figuring out how to use a toaster oven in lieu of a standard oven? Thanks. Uh, the trick is just to use it, um, just to go for it. Uh, you know what? I was I was completely against a toaster oven. I never understood why we needed one or why one would be beneficial uh, until sort of acquiesced and uh, my wife really wanted one and we got one. I now cook most of my meals in there. Uh, and that was just sort of trial and error uh, between trying to figure it out, et cetera. But uh, I, you know, I think just kind of go for it. I've actually found that the, the toaster oven, uh, and you say you have a nice one, so I imagine it probably has a lot of these functions. This one's like 119 bucks or something. Um, I actually find this easier to use than my big oven, and the reason why is that the heat is a lot more 
easily managed here because there's a smaller area. So less energy has to go into it in order to get it to where we want it to be, right? Um, that's just a lot more volume of space and of metal and of density of cold parts that need to be warmed up. Uh, this I find just be more consistent in heat, easier to use. So in that way, uh, I would just kind of say, just have confidence, just go for it and do it. Um, that these are enough analog to the big oven, the built-in ovens that you're not going to find that it, it's a different cooking method or process. Um, one of the things that I do often use in this uh, more uh, that I've really learned to use in this are dishes that have a little bit more uh, density to them. So I've got this, this wonderful, this is a Staub dish. And those of you who've joined me before know that I, uh, hold on one second. I've got something weird happening with my computer. Okay. There we go. Um, dishes that hold heat. So I'll get this rip roaring hot on the stovetop and I'll throw my, my fish on it. Then I will throw my roasted root vegetables on it, et cetera, and then throw it into the oven. And in that way, you get a lot of heat conductivity. You get a lot of that char and caramelization that you want um, if that's what you're going for. So, you know, while you're waiting for your oven, give yourself a, a holiday present. Invest in a nice pan like this. Something that will fit inside of the oven helps and something that you can close the door on. Too, but uh, otherwise they're really kind of pretty analog um, in terms of cooking. So, all right, let me check. All right, we'll take one more question and do that. From Mary Ellen, hi friend, nice to see you. I would like to make shepherd's pie a bit more substantial. Do you think lentils would be a good addition, or can you suggest something else? Thank you. I'm new to the course and enjoying it so much. Well, of course. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, you might be new to the uh, the forks over knives or the plant based courses. Uh, and anyway, welcome to the Ruby family. So, a way to make it more substantial, absolutely. So, a layer of lentils, kind of cooked down to a bit of a puree, uh, would be a very nice addition. Uh, you could put it as a layer underneath your potato layer, etc. It would add both a lot of flavor as well as uh, nutrition, substance, um, but also it would be a very nice flavor because it has that, that richness. Uh, I, I won't say meatiness of flavor, but that satisfying depth of flavor, right? So lentils would be a really good way to do that. Uh, another thing that I really like to do that I've, I've done in the past is to uh, sprinkle oven toasted quinoa or something over the top of the mashed potatoes to give it you know, oftentimes shepherd's pies are sort of finished in the broiler to give them just a little bit of texture and caramelization on top of the potatoes. But toasted quinoa, sort of very generously, liberally sprinkled over the top almost to cover it, like a crumb topping, uh, is a really great way to add nutrition, but also this, this really wonderful textural contrast because shepherd's pie is really kind of mono-textural. Um, so that's a good way to do it. And then, of course, uh, just bulking up the vegetables. Uh, and maybe the solution to this is to find a different pan to cook it in. Uh, you know, if you're cooking it in a pie pan, you've only got about an inch of height to work with. Okay, fine. Find a deeper pan. If you want more substance to it, more depth. Uh, you know, if I make shepherd's pie, I'm using something like this, which is about you know, it's three fingers deep or so. Uh, and I'm very lucky to have... I've written eight cookbooks, and so I have a lot of props in the closet of things that, uh, you know, for photo shoots, et cetera, and a lot of stuff that people have generously given me over the years. So I, I'm, I'm aware that I'm just pulling out sort of very aspirational pieces of cookware here. So I, I'm, and I'm aware of how lucky I am to have them. But uh, you know, something like this, just by virtue of the structure of the vessel, is going to allow you more substance, sort of more layers to it. So you can do something a little more integrated. Hey, thanks. Appreciate the question. And I appreciate you joining us. All right. So I'm going to strain these potatoes. Uh, da, 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 da. Show you the doneness on them first. So that potato is still very much intact. The edges are still sort of crisp, uh, meaning it isn't 
sloughing off or sort of just falling apart, but just with gentle pressure, you can break them apart. There you go, that is about perfect doneness. The garlic pieces that were in there, um, soft, sweet, nutty, aromatic. There you go. All right, just going to drain. And I'm going to leave a little bit of that potato water in there. I've probably got about a half cup or so in there. Why? Because it tastes like potatoes. It's delicious. And yeah, why not? And it's already there. It's a little bit less yogurt than you, you would need to use otherwise. Plus, the addition of that water in there allows you to mash the potato first before whipping in or folding in your sort of final ingredient, whether that's olive oil, whether it's butter, whether it's cream, um, whatever it is you're doing. I don't know if you all can see this, but that's what my disorganized kitchen looks like because every time, right before I come on these live events with you, I'm like, oh, I got frantically trying to make my kitchen look like I'm a reasonable human being and I open the drawer and shove everything in there. So potato masher or a ricer, which is a machine that uh, I use quite a bit for multiple things. I'm, I'm, I'm a farmer, so I have a lot of seasonal bounty to take care of, tomatoes to can, etc. cetera. Um, so a ricer is a very useful tool in that way. There you go. So now the potatoes, I'm not gonna mix it any more than that. Uh, with the with the masher, and I'm showing you things that are not very not very interesting to see necessarily, but it is important because you want that fl fluffiness to it. So what I'm doing here is I am more folding in than anything else. I'm not smashing it around. I'm not pressing the potatoes up against the side of the pan. I'm merely kind of working them around, not trying to develop those starches because potatoes get gummy when they're whipped together because those starches break down and just glom onto each other. So you can see them kind of folding, turning, stirring, but always the end of the motion, do you see what I'm doing? The end of the motion is always up. That's kind of the key. No matter what you're doing, kind of end on, you know, if you think that what's your end result here? I want lightness, I want fluffiness. Okay, well, literally create the motion that helps you do that and just lifting it up. So I don't require a super fine silken texture potato, but that's very close to what I've got here. Just a little bit of texture to it, some of those little pieces, which I think makes it really a lot more interesting to eat. Um, and this yogurt, the Greek yogurt, the reason why I love that is it marries really well with the garlic that's in there, but it's also acidic. And acid is the thing that mashed potatoes are almost always missing. What do they have? They have earthy, creamy, fatty flavor to them. Adding that acidity to it really brightens it and it takes mashed potatoes away from being just this like thing on the side to really being a very compelling ingredients. And you know what? Potatoes taste really good if you let them taste like potatoes. So that's what we've done. So there is your garlic yogurt mashed potatoes and a couple of tricks and techniques for that. And mashed potatoes all over the floor. All right. So let's take another several questions here. So we've got a whole bunch more in just a few more minutes here. So, Chef Borton, I've enjoyed your events. Well, thank you so much from Sherry. Uh, quick question about herbs. I grow my own and rinse them before mincing them, and they, of course, stick to my chef knife. Do we really need to rinse before mincing? Um, that's up to you and how much you like sand and dirt in your food. Um, if you grow your own, you can be relatively sure that, you know, where they're coming from. Like when you buy cilantro or parsley at the store, cilantro especially tends to be very sandy. Uh, so I always wash that because the bottom line is I'd rather herbs stick to my chef knife and I have a little trouble chopping them. I would much rather have that than have my dish end up being sandy and I'm not liking it at all, right? So sort of what's the, what's the worse, what's the lesser evil there? <coughs> Difficulty in chopping. Now, I've got some herbs 
for a sauce that I was going to make a salsa verde uh, to show you. So these are herbs that I have washed. Uh, and once I wash them, I sort of pat them dry on towels. And if you can help it, and this is something I'm, I'm sure you could do, is go pick your herbs 20 minutes, half an hour earlier than maybe you have been, and just give them a chance to dry. Just sort of slap them out. You don't want to crush them. You don't want to squeegee them out. Uh, but I didn't really put a whole lot of effort into drying these, and here you go. And the other way to sort of focus on chopping herbs is if they're sh sticking to your knife, it's also think about how you're using your knife. So I sort of fold herbs in that bunch back together and then holding it with my hands coming across once. And then Instead of trying to move the herbs, you know it's a lot easier to move than the herbs? That's about how much is sticking to the knife. You are. You're very easy to move. Watch this. <laughs> you see that? Highly technical. Now I have all of those herbs sort of shift and nod. Now, don't really need to move the herbs. I just move myself, change that angle, and I can come across them just one time. And in that way, and with that effort, you end up with herbs that are nicely chopped. You know, it's not French laundry perfection, little brunoise celery, or brunoise parsley, but it's a very nice way to do it. So, yes, wash them, uh, give them a little bit of time to dry, and then chop them in that way. So, there you go. Hope that helps, Sherry. Appreciate you joining us. Hey, Chef, what seafood would you use to make seafood and vegetable jelly? Wow. Okay, here's a new one. Um, seafood available. Cod, stingray, black pollock, monkfish, rockfish, scallop, mussels, shrimp. Ooh. And what would you add to the dish to make it both appealing and tasty? <laughs> All right. So seafood and jelly. So this is like a gelatin aspic type thing here. The stock that you want to use is something something that's going to have that gelatin to it. Now, you mentioned monkfish. Monkfish is the fish with the highest level of gelatin that I've seen, that and sable fish. But monkfish spines, uh, if you can get them, or monkfish skin, or even that gelatinous sort of purplish skin that's on the monkfish, makes an incredibly gelatinous stock. If you have access to a whole monkfish, uh, not only does that tail, that cartilage that's in there make great stock, but if you have a whole monkfish where the head is, Monkfish stock made from heads, once it is cold, you can literally play basketball with it. It is, I mean, it, it is so gelatinous, it bounces, maybe too much so for your aspic, which needs to be a perfect sort of blend between set so that it holds the ingredients uh, and too hard to the point where it's not really palatable. And so for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, we're just vegetables and pieces of seafood that are set inside of a, basically a seafood jello. Um, and this is very sort of fancy French food and very popular and trendy at the moment. Uh, the other thing to use are, you know, cook your ingredients, whatever you're going to use in that same stock, uh, for the purpose of just integrating flavors and think about a diversity of texture and flavor. So you want to have something with some color to it, whether that's herbs, whether that's carrots, whether that's, uh, you know, uh, rehydrated raisins, something like that. So you have these sort of textural, but also color contrasts that you can look to. Uh, and also think about just what seafood ingredients you have. And you mentioned uh, a whole lot there that are basically white uh, with the exception of shrimp. Uh, shrimp are gonna have that nice pinkish, orange, sort of reddish color to them. Uh, use that to your advantage. Um, you know, if this is your shrimp, instead of cutting pieces like this, where you're just gonna have these thin bands of that color on the outside, slice them like this. So you end up with these sheets of shrimp, which are identifiable by shape and color. Um, and you're just gonna, I think, get a lot more visual appeal to that, but also integration into the dish. So, hey, Fafat, great question, fun question. I appreciate you, you popping in. All right, from Donna C, I've been very frustrated trying to source great quality, ideally organic, local produce, meats, cheeses, and fish in the end in, in an area that has a deep love affair with fast food. Oh, sorry to hear. 
Any ideas how to find products not in stores or at farmer's markets? So Donna, um, yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's a number of online options, uh, more and more so sort of the grocery delivery box uh, is becoming a thing. Uh, I have to say that I am not actually aware of, I, I couldn't give you the best recommendation for one uh, because I don't use them because I live on my own farm and I, I grow everything I want to basically. Uh, but check out the chef's garden is a really great one. They're a uh, purveyor and they, they sell to a lot of the very top restaurants and, and they grow boutique fun chefy vegetables. Um, but look up online CSA community supported agriculture. So that is a method by which you invest in basically the season ahead of time. You guarantee a farmer uh, X number of dollars per week, and they guarantee you a box of whatever they can deliver. And in this way, it, it's very good for the farmer because it gives them direct access to you, the consumer, without the cost and the expense and the time expenditure of having to go to a farmer's market and wait for you to come to them. Uh, in this way, they know exactly how many people are signed up. It takes a lot of the risk out of the farming, and it, it's it's just great all the way around. So even in an area that might not support farmers' markets uh, due to a lack of sort of mass interest, uh, I'm sure that there are farmers doing good things near you, and they are interested in finding you. So online community supported agriculture for uh, meats. Uh, I know Butcher Box does a nice job uh, with sourcing some ethical stuff. Look for, um, oh, geez, man. I don't, even, I don't think about meat that often. So, um, yeah. For seafood, there's a great company called True Fin Seafood, and they operate here out of the Gulf of Maine. They do incredible quality products. Um, yeah, there's a number of online services. So C2 Table is another one that does direct consumer fishing that I would recommend as good friends. Um, so there you go. But I, I appreciate and understand your frustration with it, but also your dedicate. I admire your dedication towards getting it right. So thanks for all you do, because without you, those markets are never going to grow and those farmers markets are never going to happen. And then all the people that only know fast food are never going to get access to really great quality food. So it starts with you. You are on a mission to improve your entire community, and I appreciate that. All right, from Kristen, can you suggest side dishes can be prepared pre 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 words in advance and then only need to be reheated without losing texture? Sure. So uh, mashed potatoes, actually a great one. Uh, you don't need to, uh, you know, if you've got a mashed potato like I just did that starts off fluffy and not gummy, uh, you can reheat it uh, gently in an oven, put it in a casserole dish, Top it with foil, add maybe just a little bit of water or something over the top of it, um, secure it so that it's not going to dehydrate, and warm it slowly in an oven. Uh, if you're trying to warm it in a pot on the stove, you're necessarily going to be stirring it too much uh, to avoid burning, and you're going to be messing with the texture. But that fluffiness is going to endure if you make the potatoes right. Mashed sweet potatoes, mashed rutabagas, uh, etc. those are all very good uh, because they're not really starchy, and so they reheat very well. Uh, you know, side dishes also, think about a wild rice salad, something like that. Again, getting back to conversation we was having earlier about strategy. You know, yes, there should be hot things on the table, but also it's okay to serve a lot of your sides to be warm or room temperature. So a wild rice salad with pomegranate seeds or arils in them and lots of toasted almonds and some fresh chopped parsley and mint, something like that. I'm like, man, that sounds really, really good, right? And really good at room temperature. Um, and not something that any of your guests are going to say like, wow, why isn't this hot, right? Uh, dense foods, things like roasted root vegetables will keep their heat for a while. Uh, you can roast them even several hours ahead of time tent them with aluminum foil or, or a cover of some sort to keep them from dehydrating. Uh, and then just a quick blast back in the oven uh, is fine. So dense foods do really well with that. Cheers. 
Hope you have a great holiday. All right. Um, let's see. From Mary Ellen again, save my veggie straps to make broth. Is there a trick to ensuring that the flavor is balanced? What general guide of veggie ratio is best? Um, you know, one of the things I like about veg stock is that it's always a little bit different and it's kind of seasonal and sometimes it's kind of herbaceous and grassy because I've got radish tops and carrot tops, et cetera, um, you know, kale stems, whatever it is. Sometimes it's going to have that greenish sort of fresh summery color to it. Uh, other times it's going to be potato peels and carrot peels and ends and trim, whatever. Um, so I think in some ways that just embrace variation in that. Uh, but one way to add some consistency to it is to look to the herbs and spices that you might use. So some toasted coriander seeds. I am a huge fan of bay leaves and I use lots of them as in I buy them by the pound. A pound of bay leaves is a lot of bay leaves. It is a bucket about this big. So I have I, it's not anything, you know, and by the way, they cost like $16. And if you go to the store and buy that little, you know, tiny jar of them, that's like $5. So for three times as much money, I can get a hundred times as many bay leaves or more. Um, and then you can just use them with abandon. And it's not about cost. Um, and you can give them away to your neighbors because you'll have a lot. So I throw a whole bunch of bay leaves in. Uh, fennel seed is another one that I really like uh, that adds just a wonderful depth and richness of flavor to it, but also throughout the season can sort of provide that consistency to it. And if you are making your veg stock and you don't have the right ratio or you're not quite getting the flavor that you want, that's a great way, you know, you can take a tablespoon, you can take three tablespoons and add it in and sort of do that blending and that balance. Um, and in terms of the right ratio, it depends on really what you're looking for out of the stock. Uh, if it's just you're trying to use up the scraps because you're combating food waste, all the best to you. Great. Thank you for doing that. You're going to end up with a, you know, if you don't have much, it's a watery broth that has an, a nice subtle flavor to it. Great. Just boil your pasta in that and, you know, use it in those ways. Uh, if you're trying to make a vegetable broth soup where it stands alone, like chicken stock wood and chicken noodle soup, uh, yeah, maybe you're going to need a little bit, you know, greater density. But generally, I would say about a half pound of scraps to two quarts of water would probably be a general ratio. So there you go. Interesting question. Thanks. All right, from Darlene. Uh, oh, uh, responding to Mary Ellen's earlier question about using lentils in a uh, shepherd's pie. And she says, I use green brown lentils in my shepherd's pie. And it's amazing. Don't use red. Ah, I would second that. Red lentils just kind of disintegrate. Um, also probably be a little distracting in their color. Delicious in flavor, but uh, for the shepherd's pie, kind of keep it earthy. Hey, Darlene, thanks. Appreciate the comment. Um, hey, Judith. I've been in testing your classes since the beginning. I'm very grateful to have found them just at the right time. Well, you're so very welcome. They saw me through the worst parts of COVID. Oh, and so I can't speak for all of us and be thankful for me. Well, thank you, Judith. That means a lot. We put a lot into these events. Patrick, uh, who's on the back side of this, on the technology side, Katie, uh, my business partner and, and colleague and, and myself. So I'm so thankful that we make an impact for you. It means a lot. Awesome. Well, that made my day. All right, from Donna, I found this article from Genevieve Co. Great. Well, thank you, Donna. I appreciate you posting that. Patrick, if you were listening, if you wouldn't mind maybe posting that comment up at the top there so it could hang around. So that article that Donna found is, in fact, the one, I, I believe, I haven't clicked the link, uh, the Genevieve Co. New York Times article about uh, the mashed potatoes. So there you go. Thanks, Donna. Appreciate the help. Nice to have a team. From Barbara, we deep fry our turkey. Woohoo! So I have no fat or juice from the turkey. How to make a tasty gravy? Uh, just buy some chicken stock or, you know what, make some chicken stock uh, on your own. It's, it's a really satisfying thing to do. Uh, and then just use that. And yes, you're not going to have the roasting uh, juices. You're not going to have those caramelized little crispy bits on the bottom of the pan to scrape off that add depth of flavor to things. So depth of flavor can be added in different ways. Uh, why don't you burn some onions, get a cast iron pan, put it on hot, get it white hot and dry, no oil and take onions, 
slice them across the equator. So you get these big rings with lots of surface area and just put them down in the white hot pan and let them burn, let them burn. Cause it's just gonna get sweet and bitter and all sorts of balanced and flavorful and happy and yay. Let them burn, it's called onion brulé um, in French. Uh, and that will add an incredible depth and richness of flavor that sort of burned, charred, oveny, roasty flavor that you, you're missing from tur deep frying the turkey. Uh, add something with a little sweetness in it, like maybe one carrot or something that's not gonna be a part of the final gravy. Uh, but will impart a lot of sweetness to it. And then take your chicken stock, take your brulee onions, take a carrot, take some uh, bay leaves, some fennel seeds, uh, which have sort of a roasty, sensuous flavor to them. And then reduce that down probably by about half till you end up with a good concentration. Strain it off and then use that, thicken that in whatever way is traditional for you, whether that's a flour and roux based or as I do, I use potato starch typically uh, or corn starch. I think it just gives me a little more control. But you're basically going to infuse and reduce a stock, either made or store bought, down to the point where it tastes really great to you. Strain it off, thicken it, and then add something a little fresh to it a little drop of lemon juice, a dash of vinegar, and I'm talking like three drops, or some fresh herbs like parsley or mint or something chopped in, tossed in at the very end. There you go. All right, from Holly, what are some ideas for simple appetizers? I like to focus on making the meal, so need something easy to keep people happy before the main eating event. Well, there you go. Great question. Um, so, uh, let's see. I made a bunch of notes here that I didn't talk about any of them before and all this. So let me look at this. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I really love to do, oysters are very traditional around Thanksgiving. Uh, so a broiled oyster or oyster on the half shell. I know this requires some work, uh, but a broiled oyster is fun and easy. You can shuck the oysters well ahead of time, put them on paper towels and keep them in your refrigerator. Um, just paper towels to keep them sort of steady so that all the juices don't run off make a butter ahead of time, butter, Parmesan, anchovies, parsley, whatever flavors you wanna throw in there, and just put pats of butter right on top of the oysters, put them in the fridge until you're ready. All you need is a toaster oven with the broiler going, uh, six minutes under the broiler, and you've got hot, toasty, roasty, amazing oysters on the half shell broiled for people. That's really kind of a signature fun dish. Uh, another one that I really love is endive, those little Belgian endive heads. Uh, one of the reasons why I love Belgian endive is it has a bitter taste to it, but that's very pleasant. Uh, it has a wonderful crunchy texture, and it also is perfectly shaped and textured and structured so it is its own little canapé appetizer boat, right? And so inside the boat of one leaf, so cut off the bottom of it just to sort of release those outer leaves and peel them off, uh, I put in uh, one... Uh, supreme or segment of orange. I put a little dollop of goat cheese and then a very simple vinaigrette, like mustard, red wine vinegar, and olive oil. Just very simple, very straightforward, just blended together and a couple of drops of that on top. So orange, goat cheese, and just a little bit of vinaigrette over the top is astoundingly good. It's also very easy. It's pretty. It lasts a while uh, and it's, it's different. You know, it's, it's kind of unique. And, um, so the other thing that I really also really like to do is smoked seafood. Uh, whether or not you're literally just opening a can of smoked mussels, uh, going, getting a package of smoked mackerel, you know, covered in pepper, some pre-sliced pre smoked salmon, whether it's cold or hot, <coughs> smoked, you know, this nice platter of tastes and textures, serve it with crostini, uh, is a really nice way to do it. It's sort of self-service. It gets people engaged. It gets them into the kitchen, but also keeps them out of your hair. And seafood is a really nice sort of flavor contrast to the flavors that are coming later as part of the meal, typically, which is all land-based for the most part in most people's traditions. There you go. There's a couple of ideas for you. Wish you well. Oh, another one. Chicken livers. Chicken liver, you've got the turkey liver, you know, the giblets that come out of there. Make a chicken liver mousse, uh, it, you know, a day ahead. You, um, and just keep it in the fridge and there you go. 
pull it out. That's a really nice one. I keep it in, in keeping with the dish. Plus it also allows you to use up uh, the giblets from the turkey. There you go. All right. Last question. Oh, hello, Chris. Nice to see you. I was wondering if you'd show up today, and I'm so pleased you did. We're hosting Thanksgiving breakfast this year. Wow. Because adult kids and their loved ones, you know. Awesome. Uh, recipe suggestions, knowing our guests will go from there, go on to other gatherings of huge feasts. Oh, how interesting, Chris. I love that idea. Um, well, that's awesome. So, Kind of going back to my answer for the, the previous question on the appetizer. So seafood is a really great way to start off a day. I love seafood breakfast. Uh, and it's also different than what they're going to be eating later in the day, right? I mean, it's almost an entirely different just ingredient category that they're likely not to see. Um, whether that's a smoked salmon Benedict, uh, go ahead and make your own hollandaise sauce. It's, it's fun or serve it in a non-traditional way, make a salsa verde, which I didn't end up making today, but salsa verde is chopped up parsley, chopped up cilantro, chopped up mint, mixed with a little bit of vinegar and some olive oil. Uh, you can throw in capers and garlic and whatever else and chili flakes if you want to. That makes it a little more sort of pungent and maybe takes it out of the sort of the breakfast realm. But um, a salsa verde instead of a hollandaise sauce over top a perfectly poached egg with you know, smoked salmon underneath and salad on the side, that green, nice potency is, is a really great way to go and easier than hollandaise and lighter. Um, so that would be one. Uh, quiche is, of course, another one. I mean, they're going to get a whole lot of pie later on in the day, so maybe starting off with egg pie isn't isn't the way to do that. But um, uh, let's see. What would another one be? You know, you could even, you can, uh, something completely non-traditional would be to go with like a poke bowl. So some brown rice, some avocado, some thin sliced tomato, cherry tomatoes or something that you can still get sweet uh, this time of year. A bunch of fresh herbs like cilantro leaves, mint leaves and parsley leaves sort of in there. Uh, brown rice and then some cubed up raw beautiful tuna uh, or some beautiful salmon or something like that. Uh, marinated with just a little bit of vinegar, some soy sauce, something like that. That, I mean, that would be a really kind of fun and different um, way to do it. And though it might not be part of the traditional tradition, bottom line is uh, this is what an American tradition, right? And America is beautiful for its diversity and the abundance of different flavors and textures and experiences and all that all of us and all of our ingredients bring to the table. So kind of maybe a a fun way to to give a nod to all of our neighbors who we cherish so dearly, but maybe don't look or cook like us. So anyway, a couple of ideas there. Well, there you go, folks. Thank you so very much for joining me today and in the past. I hope you will join me again in the future. We've got a couple of other events coming up that you will hear about. But most importantly, please cook with love, cook with gratitude, cook for others, and be reminded of what's really beautiful in this world, and that is uh, being with other people and the companionship and love we get. So food is love. Bon appetit, y'all. We'll see you.